Sorry about that. I'm like talking and nothing's happening, you know. <laughs> hey, everyone. Almost there. Okay. Are we live now? What's going on? What's up? How do you finger ninth arpeggio? Uh oh, we got some tough questions. It's early in the morning, but I got this going on, so it's all good. How you guys doing? How's everybody doing? Um, shelter in place. That's what's up. Let me just make sure this is working. Can you guys see me and everything? It's 5 p.m. in France. Yes. Bonjour, mon ami. Can you guys hear me? Cool. I I, I hate always having to ask that, but um. You know, I'm here by myself. I got a whole bunch of new equipment. Well, I, we have some reconfigured equipment and trying to get the set looking better. Uh, you know, trying to, trying to up our game here, uh, as it were. I'm going to get the uh, see what you think. Good morning. How much coffee do you drink? You know what? I, I was drinking like one or two cups a day. It's kind of gotten up just because stuff has been so crazy. Uh, what about you guys? Okay, that's a good one. Instead of just being like, hey, where are you in the world? Although I love hearing about that. Uh, you can see in here, good. Um, how many cups of coffee or tea do you drink? So say, can everybody answer me that? That'll be a fun one. Like, uh, Or maybe you drink something else. Whatever you drink and then how many cups of the beverage that you drink the most. Although I would say I drink probably three to four cups of coffee a day, but I definitely drink more water. I've been trying to drink a lot of water. I think it's super important. Everything sounds good. Good, 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 good. Um, and so we're going to get going here, answer some questions, have some fun. And um, I want to see if I can get your questions going up here. So, yeah, is that coffee beyond? <laughs> yeah, it's coffee. It's early here. I mean, you know, if I needed to drink, I would drink. But this is actually big shout out to Blueprint Coffee, uh, one of our St. Louis local roasters that um, is soldiering on. They've had to close their cafes. But big shout to uh, blueprint actually you can go to you can order their stuff from anywhere uh, they drop it by my house which is cool because they're around the corning corner but you can go to blueprintcoffee.com uh, or something um sorry i'm talking while i'm actually trying to do something because i want to get the uh boom, 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 boom oh there we go there they are okay uh i quit coffee last year and since then <laughs> never stopped practicing that's smart there we go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. The thing I love about this system is that I can get some of your comments onto here. Ooh, Enrico, what's up, Enrico? Uh, I quit coffee last year, and since then I never stopped practicing. That's good. Um, that's awesome. Okay, let's get into some questions here, and then I'm gonna get the keyboard going in a second. Um, who's your favorite musician from? I cannot pronounce those characters. That looks like Korean, though. Please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, oh, Anne, how you doing, Anne? Thank you so much. That is that is too kind of you. I'm going to get back to who is my favorite musician, but this is really a beautiful thing. Thank you. 20 euros. Euros are awesome. I love euros. <laughs> um, and that's really kind of you. So I'm going to try to deliver some, some um, something hopefully interesting, edifying, educational, something maybe possibly game changing for you. I know like I've talked to people sometimes, friends of mine, other musicians, or just heard things and you know, certain things will go by. Um, and it's, it's up to us whether or not we grasp onto them or not. Like there's information out there in the world. And, um, I always want to try to be somebody that, that contributes something positive to somebody. So I, since that's my sincere hope today is that we can at least get some of that, some little nuggets. So um, okay, my favorite musician, you know, there, there's so many, I, I really, it's hard to say, but CV Wonder certainly comes to mind. I mean, the joy that he brings from listening his music, from playing his music, from learning, it's, it's kind of just overall, but I mean, you know, geez, I mean, Mozart and Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, someone I've been thinking about a lot for sure, you know, um, I mean, how do you, I don't know, it's hard to say a favorite among all those, but those are, those are a few of my favorite musicians um okay so let's get some other questions here because this is ask me anything oh i thought this was gonna be q a it's ask me anything so that puts a little more pressure on me you know what i'm saying um how much coffee you drink i answered that one um 
I'm just going to give a couple of quick, quick shout outs because I love this. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, India. This is Atul. What's up, Atul? We've been getting a lot of love from India, and I, I love that. And it's um, it's really always been on my bucket list of places to go. But it's one of those huge countries, one of the most populous countries in the world. Um, and I've never been. So, like, I'm looking at this time of no travel, shelter at home, practicing, developing. And I want to go to India. Like, that's one of those places. India, Russia, some big places. Sorry, trying to hook up my lighting. Um, that's one of those places I really want to go. So good to see you guys here. Uh, what's up, Rich? Good morning from sunny Las Vegas. Nice. It is semi-sunny here. Um, Vegas. I've been there. I love it. Hope you're doing well out there. Um, okay, I'm going to go back up to the beginning because I think there might have been... Uh, okay. Ask me anything. Bam. I hope I can answer it. <laughs> Mitchell says, when you see a tune... Can you guys hear that? Hopefully so. Uh, when you see a tune, how do you know what scale to play for each chord? Example, affirmation, George Benson, E minor to B minor, A minor 7 to G, D7, G7. Uh, let me add these on here so it'll make sense. When you see a tune, how do you know what scale to play for each chord? Example, affirmation, E minor 7... To B minor seven. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. Hopefully you can still hear it though. Yeah. Uh, e minor seven, E minor seven to B minor seven. Uh, a minor seven, D seven, G seven, E seven, A seven. What scale for each chords? Okay. So we can talk about um, different scale options. E minor, E minor nine. Yeah. E minor nine, you know, certainly you're thinking about Dorian or maybe even Aeolian. But I think Dorian minor six um, with the nine. But I like that you put a progression in there, right? So E minor two B, B minor seven two A minor seven. Let me put that back up there because this is the thing, like chords are never, it's always in the context of music. We're playing music for people, right? They don't know about chords or scales. I mean, they might think they know the, the word or something, but they don't really know. So um, we have to create music and a story. And so the reason it's called a progression is because it's progressing to something else and to something else. So I like to try to find scales and not only scales, but that's one of the elements that we use to be able to tell that story but to go over a number of chords so if i'm going b minor e, e minor to, to to b minor i'm already thinking about what's how can i connect those together so e minor nine would be dorian would be the same as e minor i mean b minor aeolian it's diatonically the same it just means it's starting on a different note so then I know I've got an option to go E minor. Uh, then if I go back to E minor, you can hear it. So that's telling a story, creating a melody with the same notes available. So harmonically, we're not going to really be moving anywhere, even though the root moves. Now, if I want to highlight a change between those, I would be like E Dorian to B maybe B Dorian and I kind of know that that's going to be a little bit of a a big change because it's a minor third on the E minor but then when I get to the B minor I made it like that major third right so that's pretty abrupt right as opposed to as opposed to keeping it there so in general it's like you're looking for those places that you can both well, either keep the same or change as you're progressing through the chord. So it's not just, yeah, at first you learn what is the scale, what are the scale choices for that chord. Then you're learning what are the, what are the scales that can fit over a number of chords. Then you're learning what are the slight variations of scales as you progress through that will make it interesting. So then you can kind of draw on it as you're telling your story. And it, it keeps it interesting and gives you more options for how you're going to kind of craft, you know, 
your, your story because we, we've got three elements. It's funny, man. This playing jazz, playing music that's improvised can start to seem so complicated. Um, and, and there's certainly a lot of complex ways to look at it. And there's a lot of inherent complexity to it. But what actually makes the music work, if you think about it from the standpoint of like, how do I tell a story, is exactly, they, it, it always goes down to those three elements and some combination of them. Melody, harmony, and rhythm. So when you look at it like that, it's like you're going up before the family tree gets all complicated. It's just a couple grandparents at the top and then you've got all this other stuff. As much as you can connect back to those three elements at all times, the better. So in this instance, for instance, you know, for E minor to B minor, we're thinking about, okay, harmonically, if we go Dorian to, to Aeolian, there's not going to be a lot of change harmonically, which is fine. So, but we want to keep that in mind in terms of melodically or rhythmically, or maybe both really being our, our options for playing around with it. Okay. So that's how scale choice is just, it should never be looked at on its own. It's always in the prism of those three elements. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right, Felix in Montreal. What's up, Felix? Your approach to creative scale practicing. Thanks for all this. Greetings from Montreal, Felix. Okay, uh, creative scale practicing. Basically, my approach on this is that um, it's great if we can practice scales, especially as pianists, but really any instrument. I mean, it's such an important part of the technique for all instruments. Uh, and so important, um, just from a technical standpoint, I mean, and then getting into like using scales over chords, of course, very important as well for creativity as a foundation. But from a technical standpoint, the concept of my concept of creative scale practice is that we never practice scales mindlessly or in a way that doesn't challenge us or isn't at least a little bit interesting because, you know, scales can be one of the most um you know, sort of bland parts of our practice that we can kind of zone out, but it's so important because it's all about developing technique, developing fingering, developing um, articulation, evenness, independence of the fin fingers, independence of the hands, all these different things. So if we're too mindless and we're just practicing. I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened there. Are we back? 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 I'm going to say, are we back? The main question mark. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I started playing a scale fast and everything froze up and said your stream ended. Okay, good. So this is good. I'm learning stuff about how to stream that you can actually get back on the same uh, YouTube stream. So that's working for you guys. Awesome. Um, okay, so let me just jump back. I don't know how much of that you missed. Uh, the question was about creative scale practice. So what I was saying is anytime we are just mindlessly practicing scales, you're going to get a little benefit, but it's like the difference between, you know, if you're um, lifting weights, you know, say you're laying back and doing barbell, whatever that is, barbell press. I'm very inspired because I saw the Q&A with uh, Warren Wolf last night and like he was just huge up in here. Very different than this. But, um, uh oh, stopped again. Uh, I hope it didn't. Poor quality though. Uh, I'm sorry. I wonder if we having, sounds like you now have the audio from your computer. No, we, oh, you're right. You're all right. Hold on. Thank you. Um, who said that? Thank you, Ricardo. Is that better? That should be better now. Yeah, everything kind of piano lowered Peter Martin. Oh, yeah. Um, the mic is coming from the computer. Thank you, Harry, as well. Okay, I think I fixed it now. Okay. Um, okay, so... We're practicing scales in a way that is creative and engages our mind. So what ends up uh, happening, okay, let's try this here. Picture, video is rough. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening here. Yeah. I'm going to keep going. And then if it doesn't get better in a second, uh, just let me know. Heaps better. Hi from Israel. Um 
it's probably my kids. I'm going to blame my kids because they're, they're going to university and high school on the same internet connection upstairs. So they're probably doing something uh, along those lines. Um, so I'll just kind of keep going. We're practicing the scales. And if we're not actively engaging, then it becomes a thing of we zone out. And so, like I was saying with lifting weights or whatever, you're not, if you're not paying attention, yeah, you're still getting a little bit of a workout. But if you're really paying attention and going slowly and going evenly, you're getting actually a better workout on your muscles. So it's very much the same when we practice scales. So in order to engage yourself, you can't just we need to practice the same scales. And at a certain point, you're going to learn all the scales, which is great. So until you've learned all the scales in all keys and can do them in a number of different ways, you don't necessarily have to be that creative because you're still learning them. You know what I mean? You're, you're still trying to really get the fingerings. And, and for pianists, especially, it's all about the fingering. That's like such a big part of the technical challenges of um, scales. So if you know all the scales and say I'm practicing... A little bit. Boom, boom. I'm practicing a D flat major scale. Like I can do this in my sleep pretty much like that. Right? Uh, so if I just do that, I'm not going to really get anything because I'm practicing something that I know how to do. So it's like a warm up thing. Creative scale practice can be anything from thirds. That's a little sticky note. Like you wouldn't think that would happen <laughs> on a uh, on a electronic keyboard. So thirds, all of a sudden, you're having to engage your mind in a different way to be able to get those fingerings. So you're what the fingering is about is automating the fingering. So it's like weird. You're using something creative to automate something. Actually, we want our fingers to be automatic. So that if I'm playing you know a line and I use a fragment of that um, scale that there's a better chance that I'm going to go to the correct fingering. And the correct fingering, it's not about, like, you can kind of finger things however you want. It's it's about coming up with a fingering that works the best for you to be able to execute in a musical way. It's not about being able to play the scale scales on the, on those on their own fast, but it's being able to articulate when you play fast or you play slow or do any of the things that are challenging. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I hope that helps. So other creative ways. Broken thirds. This is over um, half hold diminished. Um, and then you can reverse it. Like being creative is just coming up with. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think it has something to do with me playing. I wasn't even playing fast that time. So uh, I'm going to not play because I don't want to keep uh, wasting you guys time by it, it cutting off. Hopefully you can see me again. Um but yeah, so just come up with something, broken thirds, broken fifths, changing directions, contrary motion. It's just about doing different things so that um, you can further automate and really ingrain these fingerings in you, okay? Maybe the YouTube system doesn't like me talking about, um, maybe just doesn't like me talking about creative scale practice because that's when things started going south, right? <laughs> um, boom, boom, boom. Okay, let's go here. It's just buffering. YouTube is just overloaded. But if you continue, we still see the whole... St oh, you do. Okay, thanks. I'm going to put that up there. Ronald says, is teaching me about YouTube. Yeah, I think the whole world might be on YouTube and Zoom and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, let's go here. When... I'm going to jump back. I apologize. I'm just looking at the ones that come up with more common. Hi, Peter. When improvising, how will you connect two chords that have few common notes? Like when the root movement in uh, moves in major minor thirds. I find it difficult to make it sound smooth and lyrical, uh, lyrical. That's from John. Connect two chords that have few common notes, like when the root moves. So, you know, I think that it's just kind of the opposite of what I was talking about um, before in terms of that B minor and that E minor. So I actually find it easier in some ways when things are changing because you have more harmonic um, progression that can add to the drama of what you're doing. So 
it's that same thing in terms of like balancing the melody, harmony, and rhythm, right? So now we know that the harmony is going to be move, moving a lot. So maybe melodically and rhythmically, we can kind of ease off a little bit. Does that make sense? Um, let me see. If... So like we're going C major to E flat major. So I play a line and I keep playing over it. So obviously I can't keep playing the same C major scale and there's so many notes that are different. But rhythmically, I can kind of just go a little bit monotonous. Little bit. Does that make sense? Um, let me see. Okay, why am I hearing myself now? This is crazy. So, like, we're going C Hold major on. to E flat major. Oh, hold on. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you, line, this is crazy. Over, so How many different ways you can start to hear yourself? Okay. I'm getting the hang of it. Okay. So, C major to E flat. Uh, so, that line can kind of have some interest as I go, because I know I'm getting into a dramatic area of harmony as soon as I go. No keys. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, no keys. Hold on, let me see if I can get this going. Man, I got cocky because it felt like last time I did this, everything was just locked in. And today, we're having a few little issues, as we say. Output. So this output should be Scarlet. Let me see if that. How about now? This is no fun. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and... <laughs> Okay, I think I'm good. But no piano sound. Okay, no, no, no I got my input back right. Um, yeah, so let me play it again because I thought it was so brilliant when I was playing. C major to E flat major. So we, we don't really have um, a chance to... We, we don't need the, the rhythm, you know what I'm saying? Like to change. So I'm going all eighth notes. Can you still not hear the keyboard? Is that what's up? Can you hear the keyboard? Can you hear the keyboard? Okay, so you know what? I'm just not going to play. Can you hear my voice better though? Can you hear my voice? Still no piano. No, sir. But can you hear my voice? Can you hear my voice? My beautiful voice. here. Man, it must sound weird just like. It must sound weird just the clicking, the clicking. Okay, so we're not going to worry about the piano for now because um, it's ridiculous just to have a click. Um, anyway, so that's the thing. So we're improvising C major, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll, I'll sing what I'm doing. Do -hoo. This is good practice. Anyway. Do boo do boo did do boo do boo do boo did it boo do 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 Right? So, um... It's that same interplay, melody, harmony, rhythm. And the way, how you can do to practice this is, you know, always be thinking about drama versus no drama. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. So it's a matter of, is there drama coming up or happening now with the harmony? Is there drama happening with the melody? Is there drama happening with the rhythm? And so for harmony, that's the easiest one out of all those to kind of wrap your head around because... C major to E flat major is a lot of drama just because there's a lot of notes different though. Okay. How about piano through the air? Exactly. So I hope that worked. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So let's, let me, let me jump back to some of the early questions and I'll try to even do some that are more or less um, piano-y if you know what I'm saying. Um, okay. This is just a shout out, but I, I like it. John, what's up? Hola, thank you. Teacher, thank you very much for sharing such valuable knowledge. Hugs from Columbia. Big hugs right back to you, Columbia, John, and everybody down there. Um, okay, here's a good question right from the beginning. Timon says, hey, Peter, do you have any creative exercise to improvise harmonies? When you are out of a tune context but in a vamp intro, it's easy to get 
stuck on two to three chords. Any creative tips harmonically? Yeah, so this is actually kind of related to what I was just talking about in terms of, um, you know, if you're on a on a beginning and let's say the tune is in C major and so you're vamping on like a G sus kind of a sound and so you're talking about um, maybe, you know, going from like D minor to G7 back and forth. So there's no harmonic drama in that because the D, D Dorian is so close. It's the same as like sort of the G sus, the G mixolydian, the G dominant, which is fine. And sometimes depending on how you're doing, um, you know, your intro, you might not want to have a lot of that. So you might want to listen to that. So don't feel like you're just stuck on something because you're not getting dramatic harmonically. Sometimes that's good. And you can just kind of riff. ba ba dee da you know depending on what the vibe is um so if you feel like it needs the more harmonic things you're going to be looking at chromatic movements minor thirds minor six in terms of where you're going from the roots so if i'm at a g sus and I apologize you guys can't hear this but i can hear it and it's beautiful uh g sus you're going up half step down or below that's the easiest way to give a lot of drama so you want to use it sparingly because you're on an intro right so you're just playing and then taking the same thing up and then taking it back and then you can kind of use your ears to sort of judge you know how much but that's really that's the most creative thing you can do harmonically just off the bat is is chromaticism what i was saying the minor third and minor six would be like you know g sus to b flat sus you know maybe up to e flat sus to b flat those are just ways to go hold on a second dan called and said the camera's out of focus okay thank you is that better i hope that'll be better in a second we'll see man i'm having i'm having some this is this is good this is humbling for me a little little technical difficulties nothing wrong with that uh no a lot wrong with that but uh we're, we're working it out here so Hopefully the camera's better here. Very good. No keys. Yeah, I know. I know. Your Peter, your camera went drastically out of fo focus. What? Uh, piano does not have a speaker, Bullock. That's otherwise. That would be actually really cool if it did. Oh, you know what? Hold up a second now. It's interesting you say that. See, that's why we have people here. What? Can you guys hear that? Maybe a little bit? A little bit now. Okay, we'll play around a little bit with that. All right, this is this is ask me anything. Uh, this is ask me anything. I'm not gonna have it on, so it doesn't feedback normally. And I'm Peter Martin, and I am a master of my domain. I'm just not a master of all the technology in here yet. Uh, but we're getting close. Uh, give Peter a little help from his friend. Oh, thank you very much, Colleen. That's so sweet of you. I hope you guys are going. How's it going with practicing for all you guys? Let me ask. Let me a, let me AMIA you guys. Um, how's the practice going? You know, everybody's like, oh, I have so much time to practice. I have I have things to do. But let's, you know, not a lot of people are talking about the challenges that are going on now in terms of like when your routine changes so much and, you know, from work and from kids or parents and like everyone's, you know, thinking, OK, we're sheltering at home. We have more time, but just life is more complicated now. So, you know, what I'm finding is, yeah, I'm getting more time to practice, but then having to focus at specific times is so important for practice. I mean, practice is not just about having the time. Time helps. But if you if you can't focus because life is so out of control, then, um, you know, it's it's like whatever. So I've been finding, you know, like some some meditation at the beginning of practice session really helps. And I really recommend that I'm by far not a, an expert in um meditation but i don't think that you have to be it's kind of like one of those things I've, I've been trying to progress in several different areas that i think will enhance my music that are not just about being at the piano meditation yoga running diet all these things that are just kind of general 
just trying to improve myself. And I do feel like it brings, you know, some better focus, especially to that beginning. Like I always find that if you start out a practice session really focused, like you can ride that for a while. So I would just recommend that for anybody. I know that um, Adam's been doing with this guided practice sessions, some kind of meditative type things, and, and he's really good about that. So we, we've been talking about that some on the podcast and that kind of thing, but highly recommend it. Okay, Tim, Peter, you have a classical background. Could you talk about how classical piano techniques um, influence your approach to jazz? Is Pishna or Hannah singing uh, something you worked with? Yes, uh, actually, Pishna, it's interesting you say that because I don't hear a lot of pianists talking about Pishna, and I think it's so important, you know. Um, uh, Hannon is, is more well-known, Cherney, but the two that I actually work with the most over the years, and I always come back to the most, um, well, there's three, uh, Pishna, Phillips Exercises for Independence of the Fingers, and Chopin Etudes. And so... Um, you know, Chopin etudes are not traditional, um, you know, uh, me- well, I mean, they're, they're etudes. So, yeah, they're, they're technical things, but they're first and foremost pieces of music. But each one of them focuses on a specific part of the piano technique. And you're getting to play some great music. It's very difficult. It takes a lot to practice, but I find those very rewarding. But, yeah, I think Pishna is brilliant. Hannon, I think, is great. I just never work with it as much as other things, you know. Um so there you go. Nick says too much work, less practice. Ah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Everybody's like, oh, I have so much more time. It's not like that for everybody. I've, I, I, and I, I get it. I've been busier than ever. And so, again, I find that like this has been a time where focusing on practice has to happen quickly, too. I mean, it's not like, oh, I've got two hours to meditate and get into a vibe and then take an Epsom salt bath and then I'm going to start practicing. That I just don't have the time for all that. That would be great. Um, but, you know. There you go. Uh, what's up, Colleen? You're very generous, and I appreciate your kind words. Always good to see you here. I love my open studio practice book. It has been so much better since I used the book. Yeah, it's that's a cool thing. You know, um, where's oh, mine's up on the piano upstairs. Um, we have those. I don't think we're shipping them now because of uh, we're trying to be careful about how we do things down at the studio and everybody's working from home. But it's a cool thing, and actually, you can kind of create one on your own. Uh, it just won't have the cool like cover and stuff, but it's basically about bringing some organization to your practice. And there's a lot of ways to do this. And, you know, Adam and the whole team kind of base this around some concepts from bullet journaling, but really more foundational in terms of how you can organize and, you know, simplify and isolate different aspects of your practice routine and just get it into a written format because, you know, there's been a lot of studies that show that once you write something down and start to systematize it that way, um, conceptually, it starts to really become real and that your retention is better and that your follow through and all those things. We still got to do it. You still got to do the work, like writing it down in the practice journal. But it gives you a plan of attack and then it gives you some accountability to yourself, which I love. Uh, What's up, Joe? Uh, One of our top members and friends from the great state of Texas, the Houston... um, Gulf region says 2020 was supposed to be a big year to focus on practice and I got sick and then this but I'm trying that's what's up we're trying we're we're always trying I think trying is progression it's like moving from cord to cord it's like you know every day we have an opportunity to do something with our practice in our piano playing and it's never straight up you know but if as long as it's like boom 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 plateau and sometimes it's going to feel like a step backwards but a step backwards is not Actually, I've never believed that you go down as long as you're practicing and, and you're you're trying and you're getting in front of the instrument, even for one minute. And I know I've had this feeling many times and it still happens to me where you'll go, um, you know, work on something for an hour and then you're like, you know what? I can't even do it as well as when, when I started. Um, I can't, you, you know, and it can be discouraging because this, the piano is not an easy instrument, but if we can keep in mind that there is a certain simplicity and beauty to it. And I'm just looking for my slippers because my feet, my feet are getting cold. It's a little, a little chilly in St. Louis. It's not like Houston. Joe, I know you guys are probably enjoying some nice warm weather. We're still getting some almost freezing temperatures. Um, but if you think about days that you're very discouraged, that, that you practice and you feel like you've wasted time, um, you haven't. 
It's just what you've actually started to achieve has not manifested itself yet because this is a very deep undertaking. You know, learning a language, learning music, learning an art form, developing your voice. Like this is one of the deepest things that you can do in your life. This is what, I mean, for, and I'm not just saying for me, personal experience for sure, but I've heard this from so many people. And it's just as important from, from somebody that just started to play when they're 40 years old or 50 years old to a seasoned professional that's been playing their whole life. Like once you embrace music and become a musician, and, and I'm not talking about professional or any of that. I'm talking about just you say I'm a musician the same way you say I am a runner or I am a vegan or I am, a, I am an anything. And you take that upon yourself. You're not saying that you're great, that you're horrible, that anything. You're just saying that you're on the journey. So those discouraging days are actually very, very important. Those ones when you feel like you're going down. In fact, if you don't have those days, you're not actually progressing. So you got to fight through those. You got to keep going and know that you're developing, um, you know, musical habits, technical habits, all the different tools that you need. Uh, and the different skills that you need to be able to eventually play something that might even please yourself, much less some other people, you know. And that's what this is about. It it takes, it takes time and and failure and getting back on the horse, and all that to start to even. I'm not even gonna say master this instrument. Just start to get to the point where you can express yourself, and that's that's what it is. So, you know, revel in those days where you feel like you're going down. Be like, wow, I know I'm getting better. It just hasn't been manifested yet, you know. But it's coming. It's coming for sure. Um, so all, all the best to you, Joe, as always, let's go back here. Yeah. I'm sorry about the, uh, the, uh, well, I can get that going if I need to. That's right. I got the, the acoustic situation happening going old school. I'm going back to see some questions. Um, Okay, Alec asks, what is a hobby outside of music that keeps you happy and motivated? Um, I've got actually a number of hobbies, probably too many. Um, I, I seem to have a bad habit of taking on too many things, uh, but um, which is great because they're all things like that I'm interested in. That's what I mean. I guess, you know, a hobby is something that you do because you want to do it because you love it. It's not something that you have to do. I mean, I don't know that. Like doing chores is not a hobby, but like building a, a a backyard she shed or something is probably a hobby. Somebody making you do something, you know, isn't a hobby. So like hobby to me always has a connotation of something that is recreational and joyous. It might be hard too. I mean, playing the piano for a lot of people is, is a hobby, um, you know. And so the same difficulties that anybody encounters, whether you say, I'm taking this on as a profession or a hobby or whatever. You're engaging as a as a musician and as a pianist. Like that's that's not like learning how to um, you know plug a battery pack in. It's, that's got a beginning and end. That's a little easier. Um, but for me, some of the hobbies like like running has become a really big hobby uh, for me. I think I'd consider that a hobby. And you know, I'm trying to do it every day or at least you know five six days a week. And I really enjoy it. I enjoy what it brings to the other things that I'm more deeply involved in professionally, like playing music, like uh, being a startup founder, you know, um, guiding open studio, these kind of things. Like the running definitely has enhancements there because I do some like deep thinking kind of meditative stuff as I'm running. But I just enjoy it. I mean, I've been doing it all my life. I love the health benefits of it. Um, I love the camaraderie among runners, but I also love the solitude of running. You know, it can kind of be both. You can run with a group, you can run in a race, or you can run on your own, mostly running on my own now, except sometimes with some family members. Well, often with some family members. Um, so, yeah, that's one hobby. Um, other hobbies, I don't know. That's probably enough. Um, okay, this is an interesting question because I don't really have an answer. George says, uh, what are your best three pedagogy jazz books? Actually, maybe you guys can answer this. I, I'm, I'm grossly... Um, I mean, there's the Levine jazz piano book, which I think is really good. Um, although, to tell you the truth, I haven't worked out of it deeply. I've looked at it. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I mean, there's great information in there. I never took it like as a pedagogical guide for me. Um, I really learned old school. I mean, I learned like the best jazz books for me were probably some transcriptions that I had. And even those, when I learned the solos directly from the recordings, I always felt like I got a lot more out of it. But I remember I did have a Bill Evans 
transcription book that a friend of my mom's gave me when she heard that I was kind of getting into jazz, a neighbor of ours. And that was kind of a, you know, because I was playing a lot of classical music at the time that I could read fairly well. And so that, that was a great entry point for me to Bill Evans music because I was so early on as far as playing and hearing jazz and even understanding harmony and things and being able to hear. St- I mean, I could hear pretty well cause I had okay ears kind of average, I would say. Um, but it wasn't until later that I started learning stuff from recordings that I really started to develop my ears. Uh, so that transcription book actually was very timely for me and just like opened me up to Bill Evans music in a way that later listening to his music, it was kind of weird. It's like I played it. I was like, wow, this is so cool. I could kind of understand the, his music from it. Of course, n- nowhere near as well as when I heard it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, let's see here. Torin, what is up? Hey, Peter, thanks so much for everything you do. I've been curious about your take on intentionally playing ahead behind the beat and how we as pianists can develop a deeper relationship with time. This is such a fantastic question and such an important part of playing so many different kinds of music that I think we're all interested in playing. Um, and you know, like a lot of things that are important, uh, the intentionality of it kind of comes and goes. I think like, I think as you're learning and and introducing to this into your kind of repertoire and, and, and an aspect of your playing intentionality is very important later on. It likely can and should um, become something that's more reactionary to the musicians that you're playing, or if you're playing solo to what's happening with the music. In other words, less thinking about it. It's still intentional, musically like i think everything we play should have a high level of musical intentionality that doesn't mean that you're conscious of that intentionality but that it's there in fact the more automated not automated automatic it becomes the better but just because you're not thinking about it or you say oh wow i didn't even realize i did that that's great if it comes off good like if you start playing behind the beat at a time and it really adds to the to the vibe and the music and there's sound musical and structural reasons for doing it, then I think that that's fantastic. Um, and it's better than thinking about it. But at the beginning, you need to think about it because you got to learn kind of how that's done. And there's like, I mean, it's difficult to do like, like to play behind the beat. Um, let me see if I can get a few things going. Hold on a second. Maybe you guys can hear that a little bit. You know, if you're, um, We have two hands at the piano. That's the joy and that's the difficulty of it. But oops, that might not work. Okay. So it's like basically, you know, you're using yourself to practice two things, playing ahead and behind the beat. Well, I guess that's one thing. And then the other is independence of the hands. So ideally you're practicing this with other musicians too, and you can certainly do that and you will do that, but you can practice it if you're a pianist on your own too. If you're a horn player, you can also practice playing ahead and behind the beat uh, with a metronome or with a recording, you know? So what it is, is like you're, The trick to playing ahead and behind the beat to keep it from sounding like you're playing out of time, which kind of defeats the purpose. That's that's a cool thing too, but it's different. Ahead and behind the beat, what's what's implicit in that is that you're still feeling the groove. So if it's one, two, three, four, one, two, that's what it is. But the ability to play something and to hear something that is ahead or behind that, or maybe even both within the same phrase, while not losing that internal clock is what's important. Listen to Charlie Parker. A lot of people don't think of him as someone that did this, but he did it a lot, especially at these slower kind of medium, slow tempos. So you can find a lot of examples, listen to it, get your ear acclimated, but then you got to just sort of start practicing it, you know, 
and try to keep it going with your hands. I'm doing it like this so that I don't screw up the sound again, you know. But that's that's um that's kind of one way to do it, I think. Um Gang Yang Joe. If I said that name correctly, I am proud of myself. I probably did not. Or it's either Gang Yuan Joe or Gang Yuan Joe. Now I did it two different ways, so it increases my odds. Um is swing feel two four accent important? Is in fast swing or up tempo? Yes, it's very important. Um two four accent though is not Bing ding 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 ding. It can be done in a way that's not correct. I think it's a slight like the way it actually manifests itself at the highest like or most kind of I think musically sophisticated level is when it's just the slightest bit of an accent on two and four, almost that you can't hear it. Like if you think about drummers, really great jazz drummers that feather the drum. You guys ever heard about that? What they mean is they're like ding 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 ding. They're they're playing the bass drum. They're playing it so quietly. And so lightly and so accurately that you can't actually hear it. You can kind of feel it. I don't know. Some of them, even the really great ones, I can't even actually feel it to tell you the truth. But they can feel it. So that's that's great. But that's kind of almost the same thing with two and four. It's like ding, 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 ding. It's it's like ding, 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 ding. It, like the accent is almost an emphasis as opposed to ding, dang, ding, dang, ding, dang, ding. Um, ding, dang, ding, 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 bang, bang. So you got... It's just a little bit of a push on it. It's not a ding ding. It's not an accent. And the faster you play, the less of it it is. So it's more of a feel thing that I would recommend you working on. And then, um, because the four, like the the cool thing about a typical swing groove and typical, there's so many different ways. Even in a four four, the same tempos to do this, and that's what's so fun about it is the different ways. But is that it's a continuous walking kind of a feel. Even if you don't have a walking bass line, that certainly gives it to it. So it's like um, there's a propelling forward of it as opposed to a, like a bum, 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 ba dum, ba ba one, two, three, four, one. I'm going to get very classical with my conducting. One, two, three, four. It's like one, two, three, four. So one, two. So you're on the off beats, as it were, the two and the four, giving it a little bit of emphasis propels forward that and gives it that really swing groove whatever we want to call it it's it's always sloppy when we call things but that's what the feel is about that's what gives it that feel the same way like a like a funk groove that's not as much like that's about the steady and then a strong emphasis on the back beat that gives it a forward propelling as well but it doesn't need as much because the accuracy and simplicity is 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 sort of built into that doom doom tack doom ding doom tack doom ding doom back to get and then if you syncopate it at all, it's like, whoa, you know, but, but that, that's why it has to be so solid. So definitely getting into areas that I think I can play, but I'm not an expert at explaining them. So, um, M one K, do you have any thoughts on slowing down the music line when transcribing? Are there any disadvantages that you have an opinion on? Cheers from Denmark. Slowing down the music line. Yes. Um, I think it's okay. I used to be really hardcore against this. I think what you're asking about is like, you know, using amazing slow downer or any tune or any number of, of great apps um, in which the pitch doesn't change, but you can more accurately or just more slowly hear what's being played to be able to identify the notes. I think it's fine. What I recommend is though, try to hear it in real time first. And regardless, if you do use a tool to slow it down, listen to it in real time as much as possible because that's how you want to interact with learning the solo and that's how you really are going to get the the best part about the ear training because remember it's not just about getting the information and the notes as quickly as possible if, if that's what it was then we would not bother listening to the recording we would just learn it from a transcription because if you read music it's a lot easier and quicker to get it that way so it's about how do you absorb all the knowledge you get not just the notes you know it's like if somebody gives a speech What's a great speech to be there live or at least to see it on video and, and audio should mean something more than just seeing a transcript 
of what they said. The words have meaning, of course, just like the notes have meaning, but how they're delivered, they can only be expressed so up to a point on the written page, right? Words and music. So when you slow things down, a lot of times you lose the efficacy of what the performer, the improviser is playing in that solo and, and you can kind of get it out of context. So if you listen to it in real time as much as possible, and then if you get stuck somewhere and you just can't hear it, or if you just don't have time, I mean, look, if we all had 10 hours a day to transcribe, we'd all be great at it. And we'd have a lot of solos we learned, but sometimes we don't have that kind of time. So try to balance it with a lot of listening to it. And then if you get, if you're getting stuck, you've been sitting for 20 minutes on the same, you know, one second and you just can't hear it. Yeah. Slow it down, get it, then get back into context, get back up at tempo. And then, um, I think that's the most effective way to balance getting the information, learning the solo, learning all the structural stuff about the solo, which is so great beyond just the notes and also getting the ear training, uh, that you can get. I still think that the ear training that you get from learning a solo is like one of the most important things. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just like getting these questions are so good at the end. I got to scroll back up. My apologies. But uh, Vol, I can't say your name. Sorry. Vol, Fortress asks, any thoughts on getting deep into gospel approaches to feel and harmony for people who didn't come up in American churches? Yeah. Just listen to the music and jump right in. The same way people that don't grow up in Germany or Europe or uh, can learn to play Mozart and Beethoven in a, in a very deep and, a, and authentic way. Music is universal. You know, uh, now if you come up in a gospel church from when you're young, hearing and playing and singing in it, are you going to be able to be a part of the musical, you know, grasp the musical information that comes out of that tradition a little easier? Yeah, of course. But it's available to anybody. Um, and I think jazz music has been one of the most brilliant and not only jazz, but jazz is certainly at the forefront of proving the universality of music and different styles that originate, you know, with certain uh, groups of people in certain areas, but then can be embraced and played and, um, and can participate in the tradition and draw upon those things. I mean, come to everything, I think with a deep amount of respect and, um, you know, that's what normally we do with music because we like it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you like gospel music, you're going to want to get that sound in. But don't let the barrier be, oh, I didn't grow up in an American church, and so I can't play that. I mean, think about all the things that people have done that they shouldn't have been able to do because they didn't come from the right place. And so that kind of disproves that. Uh, John, what's up, John? Always good to see you. As I practice for hours, I find myself gradually tend to play in a quite... Um, ambiguous style like something between swing and bebop what should i do thank you well what's wrong with that i don't know um swing and bebop is fine i think you know it's possible i'm not sure not having heard exactly what you're talking about but you know it's possible that you're starting to develop a style you know what i mean and if you feel like it's trending too much towards one of those areas or maybe is too is not varied enough in, with only swing and bebop and you want more modern stuff, then you need to just be listening and working on stuff that's more modern and then give it time. Like don't force it into your playing. You know, I talk about, um, you know, having time to just practice performing. And I think that's a good time to sort of evaluate where you're at. And look, none of us, nobody's really doing any gigs hardly um, right now. So, and certainly almost none in front of, an audience so we need to be our own audience you can record yourself as you practice performing and i like to do this at the end of a practice session wherein you would say like um i've been working on lush life the tune and you know trying to get the changes maybe transcribing some stuff listening to some different versions working out the voicings and stuff and then you say okay i'm just gonna play it like i'm on a gig but you have to really stick to that you can record yourself and that's a good time to kind of evaluate these kind of things and and hear more accurately Maybe you're not actually as bebop and swing as you think you are. Maybe you are, but you're saying if you practice for a while, like our objectivity on how we actually sound can be a little bit skewed. So record yourself, record video if you want. I mean, you know, it's really about the sound though, I think, but how we look, I guess, is important too. Um, <laughs> now, now, like, now, Naoki, Naoki, I should know that better. I uh, haven't been to Japan about 30 times. Matobayashi. Uh, do you have any tips for transcribing voicings? Well, yes. Okay. 
you just have to grab note it note by note what what you think that you hear and sometimes it's just trial and error just playing a note so you if you want to hear one voicing you got to do it one at a time you pl- hear the voicing and then pause it as soon as it is and then just try to find one note at a time that you are sure is being played and so you've only got 12 choices i mean they could be in any octave you got to find the register too once you find one that you're sure of then try to add one more Okay, don't start with like, I think this is the voicing and then start to take away notes. That's that takes a lot longer. You has to be additive. So you get one, then you add another. Now, when, how do you know when you get there? You pause it and you think you have the voicing and then you play it right after and just compare out sounds. And you might have to like wait and come back the next day and do it. Like don't get stuck on any one voicing too. What I found, especially when I was doing a lot of transcribing is like you can waste a lot of time like waiting for your ears to catch up with you like get as much as you can and then when you can't add any more notes just wait and come back to it go to another part go to the right hand or something um because overnight you know as you're developing your ears every time you pause it and then play it again pause it and try and you make a mistake that's great be glad that you can't find it because that's when your ears are developing and we talked about earlier you know kind of the peaks and valleys of practice um Sometimes you, this stuff will kind of seep in over overnight or over a week or whatever. So you have, then come back and try it the next day. Maybe it's a little easier. Uh, but but always find the areas that are both very difficult to hear and, and the areas that you can make some real progress. Because you never want a day to go by where you spend three hours transcribing a solo and you stuck the whole time on one chord and then you still don't get it. Give yourself, the, you know, don't get discouraged. That'll discourage you. That'll discourage anyway. So give yourself something that you can hold on to even if you have to jump jump later in the solo. Um, thank you guys for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, um, thank you guys for hanging out. This means a lot to me. We're going to keep working on, I've actually been thinking about trying to do something every day at some time because I talk about making mistakes, like just being able to get like the keyboard sound. Although last time we had it together, like that's the only way you learn this stuff. I mean, if you guys could see, and you can't see because I've got the camera fixed now. Like, I mean, I've been thrown into a situation like everybody where we're doing stuff. I usually at our studio, we have a great audio engineer and a video editor stuff that sets up a lot of stuff. This has really taught me that it's like I got to learn how to use some of this stuff. So, you know, some of it's working, some of it's not, but I want to keep getting better at it. And it's the same thing with like all these things, learning solos, um, learning new tunes and stuff. We have to be willing to jump in there and do it and make those mistakes because that's how we get better. I mean, you can't skip over certain certain um, steps, I think. Um What's your advice for classical pianists uh, who want to start playing jazz without a teacher? Itamar, Itamar, how are you? Thank you for the question. Yes, classical pianists. Okay, first of all, maybe just because of like how I was involved in playing, you know, several styles of music as I was growing up and hearing some different styles. I've never seen this like hard line between classical and jazz. Like to me, I see more overlap and and the piano being the main reason why. I mean, I think about it in terms of other instruments too, but I know the piano the best. So I feel like I can speak best on that. But the idea of looking at, you know, conceptually what it takes to play jazz and what it takes to play classical, just from from a piano standpoint, there's more in common than there is different, I think. A lot of the additional skills that you need to play jazz kind of actually fall outside of the realm of specific piano technique. In a lot of ways, everything that you need technically to play jazz, at least at a foundational level, exists in a classical technique. Because jazz piano was, you know, from the instrument specific to the piano from that standpoint was very much built on top of the classical piano technique. Now, obviously classical music was and still developing as well. And then there's been influence from jazz back to classical, but I'm even speaking more from just a piano standpoint. Um, There was certain classical pianists that saw what Art Tatum did and Oscar Peterson did. And were like, wow, I want to develop some of that technique that was specific to what they were playing and hearing that didn't exist in classical music. But oftentimes we're looking at the great jazz pianists, be it Jelly Roll Morton, Herbie Hancock, um, Chick Corea, Brad Meldow, um, you know, uh, I mean, almost Oscar Peterson, Art Tatum, of course, 
um, Thelonious Monk. I mean, there's a lot of classical training, probably more so than most other instruments in the jazz that are commonly used in the jazz world. More classical training for pianists than uh, than you typically see. So that's an advantage. So you want to learn to play jazz and you don't have a teacher, but you're a classical pianist. You've already got a lot of the skills necessary to do it. So what you need to do is kind of wrap your head around ear training, like acclimating your ears to the jazz sound, needing to have a certain amount of understanding and, and of like chord structures and harmonic structures, but not even so much from the theoretical standpoint, but from an ear training standpoint. And you have to get over a barrier of like, I don't have good ears or I do have good ears. Everybody can develop their ears. I, I mean, I'm convinced of this. I know that there's some, some dispute about this. I'm not saying that everybody can develop perfect pitch. I'm saying that everybody can develop better ears the same way that everybody can develop bigger muscles. Can we all be Warren Wolf? Probably not, but you can get closer to that and you can develop. And so that's such an important part of playing jazz, even if you're playing solo piano, that you need to work that into your practice routine. But it can be very foundational in the same way that you took it out of classical music, intervals, identifying chords. Um, you just need to start to get into some upper structures that you typically might not have learned in classical music that are important for jazz, sharp nines, flat nines. But it's all still just playing and hearing it, identifying it, making mistakes with it, growing, getting better each day. I mean, it's the same kind of things. Now, we do at Open Studio have some quick commercial plug to our sponsor. Um, I think some really good courses for, actually, Jazz Piano for Beginners and Jazz Piano Jumpstart, I really believe that they fit a number of different pianists, but I, I always thought w when I created Jazz Piano for Beginners, it was the perfect usage case with somebody who could play the piano possibly really well, but even just functionally, I like, could play some basic classical things and like knew where uh, beyond just middle C could play the instrument, you know, and they had that combination of being able to play and they loved jazz and were listening to it already and identify with the sound. They maybe couldn't play any jazz but they liked the sound because if you have a love for that sound and want to like, just like hearing a language or a style of food, I love Italian food. I love to eat it. I don't know anything about how to cook it. Like if you've got that kind of thing with jazz and you can play the piano, then jazz piano for beginners at open studio jazz is really good. I think because that's sort of where I pick you up and start with you. I don't teach you, you know, how to, um, you know, play the left hand differently than the right hand and bass clef and treble clef. We don't do any of that. It's not how to play the piano. It's how to play jazz if you're already a pianist. And you don't have to be a great pianist at all. Um, now, of course, if you have an in-person teacher, I think it's even better. And like what I always say with our video courses, this is for if you don't have access to going to somebody, if you're somewhere that's, you know, or supplemental to being with a teacher. But I, I, but we've had a lot of students that have learned to play surprisingly well right from that beginner level. And then we've got a lot of courses beyond that, too. Um, all right. We got a lot of questions and I'm sorry that I keep trending towards the bottom. I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of a bottom feeder, I guess. I don't know if that's good. <laughs> so I'm going to force myself up, but it keeps scrolling by. Oh, uh, thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here. I, I can't say that enough. Um, okay. I don't know if I understand this question, so I might need you guys help. Eternal Rainbow. I love that name. Till now, I know except of myself, no pianists that use it, but I'm not an experienced pianist. I will only play five years serious. But I need the pros to look at this subject. So, okay, you might have been referring to something you said earlier. Sorry that I missed it. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know what you're asking about. I'll try to find your earliest things. Oh, about uh, inversions. Oh, you got a bunch of questions. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to go to an easier one before I get overwhelmed. Uh, what's up, Boogie? Boogie Jensen. Um... Uh, you should sit with your elbows just below the white keys and people seem to sit with just under the knees, something like that. Okay, you got a lot of conversations, which is great going to each other. But I think because I do see some other questions about piano position, I'll just talk about and, – and this is something I'm trying to fix here now, so I'm not – well, you can't really see great. But yeah, you can see that, right? Okay, piano positioning. This is very personal, so – we, and we did a podcast last week with a with an orthopedic surgeon who really gave me some great insights about some things that we believe what's true and what's not about you know tendons and muscles and how they're connected down to the fingers. But from a conceptual standpoint, I think it's very important to sit at the piano. And Doctor Doctor Chuck, who we had on, inf reinforces and we, it was not a setup. The idea being that you're not your wrist is not like that. 
and it's not like that. It is as straight and natural as possible. So when that you're taking that same kind of and you can just feel it, you know, to the instrument, then your height needs to be and your posture needs to be lined up so that that is in place. So obviously for different heights, different lengths of your arm, your seating or whatever, that's why an adjustable bench is so important. I mean, it's very rare that I go to a gig. Well, I don't go to any gigs. Nobody goes to gigs. But back when we had gigs, and we're, we're going to get back there, occasionally you go to a gig and they didn't have an adjustable bench. They had a fixed bench. Like that's just like a no non-starter for me. It's just so hard to make it through the gig. I'd rather play on a horrible upright piano with an adjustable bench than a non-adjustable bench that I'm out of whack the whole night. So if you can't, and look, adjustable doesn't have to be a $350 Steinway padded adjustable bench. You can adjust it by putting wood under it or a, 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 a pillow or whatever. But you want to get, I believe, at least as a starting point to that position where you're not bending wrist either way now when you play do i bend back of course you know the, you're going to do a lot of crazy stuff but the goal and you want to be 80 90 percent of the time to be very you know put yourself in a position where you're going to have less chance of injury and this was confirmed confirmed by the good by the good doc um by not getting your stuff out of alignment and then repeating it because whatever you're doing especially when we practice like that's actually the biggest chance we have for injury as pianists um, is practice because we're more likely to do something over and over again and to get to get into a very intense situation where we don't realize the tension that we're bringing to our body. You know, so taking breaks, really good position, good posture, super important. Uh, Sebastian. Uh, Peter, I have a question. Bebop scales are just one scale with their modes or there are different bebop scales and each one has their own modes. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I only learned one bebop scale. There's a lot of scales that work in bebop, if that's what you're asking about. But these traditional, the bebop scale, let's see if I get my sound going again. Or. So it's an octatonic scale, eight note scale. One, two, three. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the reason I'm saying that the eight note part is important is because it's not just about the additional, you know, major seventh with the dominant seventh. The eight note gives it a ability to be used in a way when you run the scale, which I don't always recommend, but there are times when that can work, that the timing comes out in, a, in an interesting way. So you've got... As opposed to as opposed to where you get there a little bit early. So and it's not a right or wrong. You can do either way and you're gonna wanna you do either way, but they're very different in terms of syncopation, you know, or if you start on the beat or on the upbeat, it gives you some interesting uh different ideas. The other kind of bebop scale, I don't know if this is official that I always think about, is connecting more with the blues, and that's this. Or so you got the minor third and the major third. And so it's just kind of like two passing, um, two non-scale tones that are passing tones and that are very close to the leading tone, almost like a double leading tone situation. Uh, Jordan asks, hey, Peter, how did playing with the great Josh Redman, uh, Joshua Reedman, I wonder if that's a subtle uh, mistake or if on purpose, Reedman is pretty cool because he plays saxophone uh how did playing with joshua redmond change you as a player um well you know it was very it, that was a very influential period for me playing with josh but i think it was sort of the whole group um certainly under josh's leadership uh and and he was and is a fantastic leader i think i mean he's very much like um, puts together interesting music and leads things, but he leads from within the group, you know, like most great leaders do in, in jazz in terms of like, there's a lot of freedom there. So it gave me a lot of chance to develop within the context of playing with others and just personal things I needed to do by playing with great musicians and getting to try things out. So he left a lot of space for that. It was never a thing of like, he would turn around and be like, play this, play softer, play. I mean, I didn't learn from him in that way because that's just not his style. 
and he's very much about like let's all grow together but it was a very open situation we're all like around the same age and um so that the the band i played with josh the the main band was brian blade on drums chris thomas i mean for most of the time chris thomas on bass myself and then peter bernstein came in part of uh, a little bit into that and rounded out the group beautifully and of course josh so you're talking about just like all monster players that influenced you know me individually and personally but the group together was very cohesive you know we were all really good friends too um and we were young so it's like you're you're developing and so there's something kind of missing in terms of like Josh was, I know like a lot of saxophonists look at Josh as an elder statesman now, which is hilarious to me because I always, you know, think of us all as 24 years old or whatever we were then, but uh, we are getting a little older, but the idea was like, because we were around the same age, it wasn't like playing with Sonny Rollins or something, or um, even like when I played with Betty Carter or Stanley Turrentine, like where you're like kind of, you're so in awe of them and there's so many things that they do that you can just be influenced and learn from. So with Josh, it wasn't more, it wasn't about that. It was more about like growing together. Uh, but I definitely learned like his seriousness about how the music is presented uh, was something that definitely influenced me at the time. I mean, I looked at myself as very serious about music, but the, just in terms of like how you put a set together, like how you present the music to people. Um, I was more of the kind of like forget the audience at that time. You know, it's like we're playing music for ourselves. And he was like that, too. But he was also like we're playing for, for people. Let's put something together that's cohesive and that makes sense. So that was something that for sure I learned. Um, and just, you know, like he really cares about every solo he plays. I mean, I do too, and I did too, but like he's just one of those people that like he keeps it serious. And everybody in that band was. So that was that was a good influence in a way in that you can have fun and you can be free, but it matters, you know, what you're doing. Um, Jonathan, I listen to your podcast every morning. Oh, thank you. I got a somewhat not disturbing message but a text right before i started this from adam saying that we're officially out of episodes today so we're going to record one in a couple minutes here and that's going to be on tomorrow uh we haven't we we had gotten so ahead uh right before pandemic because i was going to be out of town for a while and now we've gotten finally caught up so we've been recording some remotely we actually yesterday did our first one that i think the video is going to work although i might have screwed something up but um we're learning. We're having fun. Thank you for listening uh, to the podcast. Uh, we really appreciate all the folks uh, around the world that are that are checking it out. And uh, it's fun. You know, it's fun to be a part of the community. We we definitely just didn't create the community. We sort of tapped into it. So we appreciate you guys letting us lead a little part of it, at least, you know, on the daily podcast vibe. Um, OK, I'm going to try to go back. Yes, Bebop Dominant Skill. Yeah, we talked about that. Uh, Joel asks, hey, super chat from someone that just went away. I'm going to try to find it. That was really cool. Um, still learning my way around here. Okay, Joel asks, uh, what are the best ways to learn and practice left-hand voicings, both rootless and root? Hope you and your family are doing well during this time. Thank you. Yeah, we're doing well. Uh, I think like everybody, like most people, um, you know, just trying to find a way to survive and then thrive during this time if possible. But I hope all you guys are doing well. Hope you're doing well, Joel, and your family. Okay, root and rootless voicings. Um, I think a good way to think about these are when you learn a voicing is try to find as many different things that you can learn in addition to just that voicing. And also, so that's that's one, is like kind of bonus stuff around that. And we're going to look at just some inversions uh, for that. And then also always thinking about voicings as whether they're rooted or rootless as being part of a progression of chords. It's very rare that we need to develop voicings that are static. They're always going somewhere. Even on like so what or impressions where you're like, oh, it's only D minor. It's, it's going somewhere. It's going to E flat minor. Then it's coming back to D minor. So, um, uh, so let's talk about the first thing. So if we have a voicing like, you know, um, C minor 7, C minor 9. That's rootless. It's a nice voicing, I think, D, E flat, G, B flat. Hopefully you guys can hear that. So I would recommend that you take all the different voicings that that gives you. So you just start inverting them. You take the bottom note and put it on top. It's the D's on top. So 
what you'll find is some of them are good, some of them aren't. And it's like anything, like any kind of mistakes or, or we're learning from the good and the bad um, because that's how you start to get to that point where you know how to choose voicings that work for different situations. You're building up your repertoire. But by going through the inversions, that gives you not only great voicings, it gives you some melodic things that you can do with the inversions. You know, that kind of stuff. But it also gives you stuff, and I'm doing it with my right hand just because of my physical setup here. But um, things that you can do later on melodically. Um, shapes. You know, shapes are so important for piano playing. Um, you know, saxophone, important too, but in different ways. So we're taking shapes. So that's kind of some bonus stuff you can get as you're developing good voicings, you know, rooted or rootless. And then the other part is, uh, I mean, I've talked about this a lot before, but it's really just conceptual. You're thinking about C minor. Where, would, where are the places that this could go? So it's not just, is that a good voicing? Maybe F7. But how do I make the decision on what alteration? So that's a triad. And that's a triad. So I'm going down to another triad, which is very effective. So I'm going to an F13 flat nine, but not because I think that's a cool voicing. It's because it's good voice leading. And that's a real basic kind of thing. But that's how you start to decide about flat nine, sharp nines, extensions that are altered based on where you're coming from and where you're going as opposed to just it's a cool voicing. Um, all right. You know what? I got I got to go because we're about to record some podcasts. Thank you guys for being here. I just want to see. Um, wow. This is so cool when you guys do this. It's just a lot of love. And I appreciate it. Nicholas through a super chat my way and said great as usual thank you very much um i hope that you're doing well i hope all of you are doing well uh no matter where you are i just want to go back and make sure i didn't miss any super chats the first couple times i did, did this i didn't even know what they were and didn't see them and felt like a big ingrate it's like you're playing a piano bar gig and you have a tip jar out and people put something in you look at them and you don't say thank you but i didn't mean it to be like that and there's no obligation for anyone to do that, of course. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just, wow, so many comments and questions. I'm sorry I missed so many. All right, we got to do this again. I mean, I know a lot of them early on were like, I can't hear the keys and I, whatever. Um, I'm going to try to do something kind of spontaneous. Mark R. Uh, thank you, Mark R. Some British pounds. Hi, Peter. You shot your bass player, but the gig is going ahead. How do you reduce, simplify all the second? The two hand voicings to one, leaving left hand for bass. Um, well, you shot the bass player. You, the gig's going on. You might want to run. But um, let's say that yeah, let's say that you the bass player has had to leave to go to another gig, which is typical for a bass player. Um, I I don't like to think about you have to replace exactly what the bass player was doing as far as like just walking bass lines. I think it's more of a matter of you want to replace the function of what they were doing you know and that's like there's ebb and flow to that we always think of like drummers do this bass players are here for this singers are here for this and the reality is in like a good cohesive unit there's like ebb and flow now is a bass player like kind of the foundation oftentimes in jazz with like especially if it's a little bit more not traditional but like you know you know, if it's not as, you know, experimental, like is the bass the kind of the, the biggest foundation and the bottom and, you know, the foundation of the rhythm section with the drums? Yes, of course. So now you've lost that. So what I'm saying is like, let's concentrate more on how do we supplement the loss of that foundation of the groove and the harmonic bottom, which luckily we played a piano, we can go down even lower than a bass can go. So we've got the, the physical space to go through, but how do we replace that as opposed to like, how do we play like a bass player, you know? So I always found that to be useful. So I'll just try to demo something, I don't know. And then I'll pretend like the bass player got shot. Yeah. So maybe the bass is like,
So if you are walking a baseline, you know, there's always using your right hand to comp and jump, jump back and forth. But there's also like, you don't have to just walk. You know, some well-placed, a little bit of walking. A little bit of walking now and then can make it feel like it's there. And then you can jump down and hit some roots and sevens, roots, you know, if you can reach the third. Um, you can give the illusion of that bass still being there. At a certain point, they're going to look and see the bass player shot and land. Well, oh, that's getting so dark. The bass player left to go to another gig. That's what it was. Um, so yeah, yeah, so just kind of, I would say, concentrate more on the function of what they're doing as opposed to the, exactly what they're playing. Because we can never play a bass line as good as it sounds on a bass. That's why we have a bass player. Um, so I'm just looking back to see. Okay, I think I, I, I'm sorry I missed so many questions. Let's do this again soon. We'll definitely announce some more, but I might just sort of start going on spontaneously because I want to get better at this. I want to get the keyboard a little bit more seamless and that kind of thing. But thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, love you guys very much. I hope you have a great day. I hope it's a productive one. Um, I hope the rest of your week is good and let's meet back here soon. Oh, we've got a bunch of live stuff we're doing. We're kind of just having so much fun with this. If you go to openstudiojazz.com slash live, can I even drop that in there? Am I sophisticated? Open studio jazz slash live. Does that work? Let's see openstudiojazz.com slash live that'll give you a schedule kind of uh what's happening this week we've got some performances from people's homes um i'm doing my little friday night um friday night shelter and shelter in place concert at open studio by myself and um we'll have some other things uh we had warren wolf last night doing a really fun q a and then i'll try to go on um i will go on like a little more spontaneously you can follow me and and um open studio on instagram because i jump on there sometimes i got a kind of cool setup where you can see the middle there so um anyway have a great day lots of love guys thanks for being here and i'll see you soon peace happy practicing <laughs>